Hello, everybody, and welcome to Virtual Trek Con 5 with Sirach Lofton and Melissa Longo. Hello, hello. Hi. My name is Ryan T. Huss. Today, we have a very special guest. Let's just get right into it. You know him as Dr. Flox from Star Trek Enterprise or just Enterprise. It is Mr. John Billingsley. Hey, John, how are you? I'm fabulous. Thanks for having me on. Dr. Thank Fuel. you so much. Is how I introduce myself in hopes that eventually that makes it into the canon. If I just keep telling people, Phil Flocks, Dr. Phil Flocks. Hi, Phil Flocks. <laughs> the, never... the canon has been resistant. It's my goal. Did they never give you a first name? No, they never did. I'm sure if it is, it's something like, you know, Vlacken Flocks or Vlamen Flocks. Or... But I'll say good old Phil Flocks. MD slash car dealership. If it's Phil well, Flocks, it has to be yeah. spelled yep. uniquely, you know, like P H H H L O, like philodendron, <laughs> which would fit insofar as Flocks is a flower. Philodendron oh. Flocks, alias Phil Flocks. Problem. Wow. We did it. Unlike Bob Picardo, the writers would always run and hide whenever I came up with an idea. Picardo was always like, <laughs> like, yeah, I'm an opera singer. Yeah, I'm having an affair with Jerry Ryan. I could never get them to do shit for me. <laughs> the door is locked. I'd slip my script ideas under. They'd be pushed right back out again. You bastards. <laughs> was, 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 was Phil Flox one of your ideas? Come on, guys. <laughs> Phil Flox. <laughs> Phil Flox, come on. No, one of my ideas is we stop and we pick up a stranded spaceship full of Denobulans, and they're all brought on board, but they're all like Oscar Madison. They leave their dishes lying around, their underpants, like, <laughs> you know, and they all look like me. It's like the entire crew is like, get these Denobulans off the ship! <laughs> I didn't like that idea. That would actually be a fun Voyager idea. They had fun yeah. episodes every once in a while. Yeah. They I mean, killed the fun. They killed the fun on our show. Where's the fun? Lower Decks might do it. <laughs> Uh, yeah, lower De lower decks. I think actually has had denobulans. Mm -hmm. For all that we were the most populous species, I mean, we were the fuck bunnies of the universe. We mm -hmm. had multiple, mm -hmm. uh, multiple wives. There were gajillion of us. I was actually pushed off the planet. There was no room for me. <laughs> like triple. I wonder where are all the denobulans? Where are they? Where are we? Uh. I thought when I had yeah. there'd never been a Denobulan before, that we were like a monastic order, that, you know, there weren't very many of us left, there were only nine, I was lonely, I wanted to be around. It turns out that, you know, that we have this much elbow room because we've, like, bred like rabbits. Which yeah. is a lesson for actors. Don't spend too much time on your backstory, because... <laughs> They're going to change it. The writers are going to have their own version. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. Did you, did, 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 were, were you thinking up ideas and pitching them all the time? No, I went in once. I went in once. And I, and that I was it. <laughs> it was only because I knew Picardo. And Picardo was always talking about how, you know, he used to go in and blah, blah, blah. I thought, oh, all right, well, all right, I'll do that. So they yeah. let me into the office. First, he showed me the blackboard where they write what they call the cheesy crusties, all the episodes that people have pitched a thousand times. So I looked at the blackboard full of cheesy crusties. It's like, that's my idea. That's my idea. <laughs> I actually, I'm done. I'm done. I, 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 I brought you three cheesy crusties and I'm leaving now. To go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, that's funny. John, oh, can we gosh. ask you then on that note? When you first, way back when, and you may have been asked this before, but when you first were going to audition for the role, um, did you get an idea of exactly who Dr. Flox was and how you wanted to do this? Um, were you kind of feeling it out? Were you just That's saying, you know what, I'm going to try something different and see what happens? No, they gave me no information whatsoever. You know, they gave me a tiny little bit of, can you hear me okay? Well, the vacuum cleaner's running in here. Yep. All right. Mm -hmm. They gave me a tiny little bit of information. They said they said uh, um, that he was a, an alien and he should have a slight alien accent. But, <laughs> I can work with that. So I just tried okay. to come up with a bunch of funny voices with my wife, and she, who was, she's also an actress, she ever ever graciously said, "No, bad sucks. No, bad. That's <laughs> my bad tail. 
no, no, stinks, no, no. Eventually, I came up with the voice I kind of ended up using, which had a slight maybe East Indian lilt. But I thought to make it more interesting that perhaps on his home planet, he's a bird. And in moments of joyous transport, oh. he would squawk with delight. So I came in and, you know, I only had the one scene. So my audition consisted of blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and I get called back and I, I'm slightly less confident about the squawk, but I do it. And I go to network, and now I'm thinking, Jesus Christ, am I going to be a bird on television? All right. <laughs> I come in, I squawk, burr, 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 burr. I get the job. And all through the lead up to filming the pilot, I keep asking, Am I a bird? I don't look like a bird. They don't dress me like a bird. Nobody says anything about being a bird. I'm like reading Audubon, I'm studying birds, I'm going out in the backyard, I'm trying to learn how to fly. <laughs> We have a fucking table read. I ask Rick and Brandon to their face. I'm squawking during the table read. Guys, am I a bird? And Rick and Brandon, who are in <laughs> cats, they just kind of look at me and go, no. feedback. <laughs> so up until the day we're shooting, the first scene, I have no idea. I I I say the lines, stress rehearsal, and Jim Conway, our director, says, John, quit fucking around, which is how I know I'm a bird. So <laughs> I was kind of getting sort of like terrified at the thought I was going to be a bird. So I think it was a relief. But yeah. Still. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, you well, audition just... for all sorts of things in this town. And sometimes you get the script and a lot of times you don't. And uh, in the so, so that do you think that the, the squawk helped you then? It, it was it was what they wanted. I, I thought to it hear. allowed me to capture what I think was really integral to the part, which is this guy is so happy, he's so enthusiastic about being here. Yeah. He doesn't care if he dies. This is the adventure of a lifetime. What a way to go! Which is right. what I loved about the character. He was exuberant and had a. A very philosophical attitude. I'm going to shut this mm. up because it's driving me crazy. Mm -hmm. Pretend we're still talking. Sure. <laughs> Actually, what's <laughs> funny about that exuberance is that it showed from day one, yeah. in the first episode, all the way through the end. And uh, John, there are a lot of characters that we know in certain Star Trek series where Clearly, their character changes based on the writing or based on the actor as the course of the six or seven or four or three seasons go on. But you seemed to have nailed it from day one because that exuberance you're talking mm -hmm. about, that positivity and that optimism, Captain, that started on day one. And you already had that. And it led all the way through like 97 episodes same type of yeah if, if i go back and i look at the pilot but i can justify it to myself i would say i'd probably want perhaps to dial down the level of enthusiasm but on the other hand you know it's like the kid who gets to go to the carnival he's never been to a carnival before humans so i i don't even <laughs> look at that and think you know maybe that was wrong he gets acclimated like all people do to new situations mm -hmm. so, yeah to your the first part of that point, you know, some of what maybe I would have liked to have seen more of is where Dr. Flux's interpersonal relations did take him perhaps on different kinds of journeys, because I don't mm -hmm. think I had the opportunity to have that exploration. There was one lovely woman who played Ensign Cutler in the first yeah. season, Fortune yeah. Kelly Waymire, who, who died tragically young of a heart oh. condition. Oh, no. And she would have been my my love interest so not mm. only did i think she was a wonderful actress in person so it was sad her loss but i i think that also sort of i lost the opportunity to have another level to the character's development mm -hmm. yeah um i've heard read um in multiple places where fans your dr flocks was their favorite one of their favorite characters in trek um, uh, mainly because of you and what you brought to the screen. What do you think the writers got right or wrong with um, well, your character? I mean, it's always so sweet when people say that, you know, I mean, it's such a, it, it, I always, you have to give so much always credit to the writers. I mean, it was their conception that I was fortunate enough to have the opportunity to, you know, 
bring to life. I don't take too much credit myself. I do think that there's a place where writers get to know actors mm -hmm. on a series and they perhaps can um, lean more into your strengths and avoid what might be perceived as your deficiencies. I think they recognized that I was, I had good verbal skills. So I think they were pretty happy at allowing me to be recondite. And um, I think they didn't necessarily have uh, a particular kind of humor uh, landing in any of the other characters, a little bit with Trip, you know, the, mm -hmm. the kind of like, you know, a variant of the ship out of water, guy, you know, the fish out of water guy. But but that, too, is more there's always that role in Star Trek, you know, the alien who looks at askance with a raised eyebrow at human foibles. Um, I appreciated dumbass things. I appreciated the fact <laughs> that I would eat anything that was put down in front of him. I, I kept asking yeah. them, can I just have like, you know, stray bits of food lying around like I've always got a sandwich, you know, in the. That would be <laughs> fun. Yeah, I, I just think the guy was like always like, oh. Hmm. It's like, don't take what that's been sitting here for weeks. Like, I'll be fine. <laughs> well, he, he was he was in his um lab feeding his many animals these the, and there was these slugs. <laughs> and then and he ate eats one. the slug. Yeah, yeah. Did no, you I really like eat a slug? <laughs> uh, I, I didn't, but they did a good job making it look like it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, some of the fans sort of felt that there might have been a slightly more uh, dramatic cold open than that, as I recall. I think one one fan review said something. I was watching Enterprise last night, and the cold open was basically the doctor feeding his fish, and then he eats something. It's mm. like, I, I didn't really feel inclined to watch that episode. <laughs> Fair <laughs> point. Good I, episode. I, by the way, everybody at home, mm. uh, I did the work for you. I looked up recondite. Uh, I'd never, <laughs> and, of course, it says abstruse. I'm like, uh, now I got to look up abstruse? Yeah. <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> uh, yes. A, a, okay. A, a, a rarefied air. Uh, okay. Other words, you know. It, it basically, fancy pants for what the fuck is he talking about? <laughs> that, that works. That's fun that too. Works. <laughs> I, I get John, that. everybody's always talked about how, well, at least, yeah, I always hear about how smart you are. Like, you know, John's a really smart guy. And that's yeah. just the, like, that's the rumor, you know, when, you're, when your back's turned, everyone talks about how smart you are. And I've always thought that. I started that rumor, to be honest with you. Oh, did you? Well, that was a great job. You did, you did. It successfully translated. Yeah. It traveled well. Yeah. But no, I see all the books behind you, and it starts to add up now. And I'm, I'm thinking, oh, this you, you love reading. You, you like, you like absorbing information. And it seems like you have all of this like knowledge. When I'm talking with you, it's like a like you could be the Jeopardy. Dream uh, Jeopardy contestant. I, I, well, one, I'm old, so my memory, you know, the actual knowledge I have has to pass through the old man's synapses. So the <laughs> answer would come out in a 45 or hour long version of Jeopardy. I might, I might stand a bit. <laughs> yeah, that's what they should have. They should have geezer Jeopardy, where it's just like people, <laughs> people in their 90s, where it's like the whole thing is like, can he hit the button at all? <laughs> you know, that, on a that music subject, will be playing for a long time. <laughs> yeah, it'll just be going full symphony. Yeah. On a similar subject, I used to love to play Teen Jeopardy. I was like, I could get like a third of these. I'm pretty good at. I'm I'm okay at Teen Jeopardy. So yeah. maybe maybe old person Jeopardy might yeah. be something that we could you know put together. Yeah. Well, this is my actually. I pitched this a lot, which nobody has bought. Is is the idea that if they brought me back, it would be in a show called Old Fat Flocks. Where it'd be like me sitting in a rocking chair at the beginning, like Edgar Buchanan in the old Petticoat Junction. Or back in the day when I was an intergalactic space doctor, I had all sorts of adventures. Oh my gosh. Let me tell you a couple of stories. And then there'd be flashback music. And then there'd be like young Dr. Flocks running around in his underpants. And then at the end of it, it would go back to me. And I go, well, stay tuned next week for another exciting episode of Old Fat Flock. I'd be one on the call sheet. I'd only have to work like an hour a week. Uh, surprisingly, oh Paramount has not called. I, uh, really? 
It's, it's a dream job. Fun, Did though. you change your number recently? Maybe that's why. <laughs> <laughs> that's probably what's happening. Check your I'm spam oh, folder. Spamming Paramount. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so I was gonna ask where do you think Flux went after you left Enterprise, but I think you answered it. <laughs> yeah, I, I think he opened a bordello. Actually, I, I oh. don't think I talk about that, but yeah, that's, that's my, I don't know. he had a limited range of interests. Really, I he, uh, yeah, I guess he went back. I went, I went back home. You know, he he was a veterinarian. Maybe he taught veterinary science. Um, I like to think he wrote a few books. I bet he hmm. could. Actually, I always sort of envisioned him like Anthony Bourdain. Like he's just traveling. That's what I was going to say. Anthony Bourdain. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. yeah. I think he had a cooking show for a number of years. Oh, that yeah. would be amazing. Yeah. Be cool. Like Bob yeah. Malakshi. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, John, when, when the fans come up to you at conventions, uh, what are some of the um, stories that you've heard about how your characters influenced people in their in their lives and maybe cause them to do different that's a, gr that's a great question I mean, we all hear stories all the time about people who you know because they grew up watching star trek decided that, that it, it, it won it was cool to be themselves you know i mean i think that's the one we hear the most that it was all right to not necessarily feel like you fit in you didn't have to worry about trying to push yourself into a you know a shape you weren't but again, for me as a as a guy who played a doctor, what I hear a lot is that people say, "I really liked your bedside manner," and mm. I, I really wanted to, as a totally as a med student, um, kind of emulate what those qualities were, and that made me feel good because I, I again, all credit to the writers, but I appreciated that interesting combination of of calm sense of humor, um, seriousness of purpose, and and firmness that the doctor had. Um, I, I, I'd i like to think that if I had a doctor, I'd have somebody who could make a joke, but also didn't bullshit me. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. um, so yeah. that means a lot. That meant a lot. Your character well, was very and, genuine in that regard. Yeah. Like yeah. He, felt, he felt warm, but yeah, matter of fact. But there was definitely a, a genuineness and a warmness in the delivery and in the care and the respect for the care. It always felt like you were respecting the person with whom you were speaking, if that makes sense. No, I, I appreciate that. And I, I do think that's true. And, 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 you know, one never likes to speak to one's own personal qualities because I don't know whether or not that's something the actor brings to the table or not, or whether or not it's just that's your job as an actor is to capture that which is on the page. But I, I do having spent many 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 years both as a stage actor and then working for social service organizations mm. I, I find that so much of our life we have to go into rooms and we have to be be deeply honest in a way that is not mean in board right. meetings in people who are afflicted if you're at all in the social services mm. on stage um it's harder in many respects on a sound stage because time is fleeting and although as actors we have to be problem solvers we have to be extremely cautious about speaking up lest we be responsible for slowing down the day but as a stage actor for 15 or 20 years you have a huge responsibility to kind of say guys i really think we need to kind of look at what's not working here because we're just repeating the same problem so can we cuddle up and um i found those qualities in Dr. Flux to be very refreshing. Mm -hmm. He didn't bullshit. He was not mm -hmm. a bullshit artist. He got straight to the point, but he didn't lose his sense of humor. And there was no judgment either. It, no. it never felt like he was judging any of his patients. It was, as you said, always matter of fact, but um, there's a level of kindness too in, in, um, in his bedside manner as well. Yeah, no, I, it's, it, it's funny because, you know, a career is such a strange thing. What I'm mostly known for outside of Star Trek is playing child molesters and serial killers. So uh, <laughs> hopefully this covers it out a bit. <laughs> so you also had a dark twist in the Orville, actually. Yeah. Yes, uh, yes. Huge yeah. fan of the Orville. Great job sharing scenes with Robert Picardo, of course. Freaking amazing. Torture, you know, the fans the went nuts. Up. 
I don't know why you know what it is that people perceive in you as an actor, but I, I frequently played lunatics and psychopaths. So to play <laughs> a wonderful guy, a guy whose nature and sensibility is much more in tune with mine, who believes very deeply that there is a place for honesty and a sense of humor wedded together as you walk through the world. Um, don't bullshit, keep your sense of humor. Don't bullshit, keep your sense of humor. Dr. Flox is probably the best part I've ever had a chance to play in mm. terms of, you know, what I thought it, 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 it rang the bell for me more than anything mm. else. I've ever done. Mm. Uh, John, some people talk about the um, makeup and prosthetics being limiting their performance and sometimes it enhances their performance. So which, which one did you feel the makeup did for you? Probably the latter, if I had to choose between them. I certainly didn't feel it limited me. For one thing, I didn't have to wear an oral prosthesis, which I think is where you really get into trouble. I mean, having to, I always thought, oh, the Ferengi, my God, to have to talk to them, <laughs> not that, you know, the teeth. or the Klingons, the teeth. Um, I mm -hmm. didn't have teeth. It, it's, it's onerous if you, you know, I was number seven on the call sheet. This didn't happen a ton, but on those on those days or in those episodes where you're prominent, you know, the additional burden of two and a half hours in the chair at the beginning of a day and an hour to take it off at the end makes for a long week. Um, mm. But it didn't interfere with my ability to articulate. It didn't interfere. And it wasn't particularly hot. The eyeballs were a problem, you know, these gargantuan blue eyes that they stick in you and they can't mm -hmm. um, account for the stigmatism. So I couldn't oh. read. I couldn't, oh. I couldn't, my eyes wouldn't focus. And if I took the eyes out, you know, it would hurt too much when I put them back in. So I had nothing to do all day except eat, um, which is unfortunate. You better uh, know you your lines read. well then. <laughs> so like, I that's read. it. You show up to set, your lines have to be memorized. <laughs> I, and I only became an actor because it seemed like a great reading opportunity. It's like, well, you're going to spend right. a long time in your trailer getting to read. <laughs> so, oh, that sounds great. <laughs> so Not a fear of a... Uh, that Dr. Flox. <laughs> wow. Yeah, Rick and Brandon, oh, wow. uh, early on, I, this is this is a measure of what happened on our show. Like, first two episodes, Crafty was like, ooh, there are Petit Four, and there's, like, French pastries, and there's... Then the ratings came in, and all of a sudden, it was like, there are only three Doritos in that bowl, and that was all. Oh. Um, yeah. <laughs> you, you, you can always tell if you're a TV show actor, and you, you, you know what you're when you got a hit and when you got a flop. Just yeah. Go to, yeah. Go to Crafty. So Rick, and, <laughs> yeah. Rick and Brandon came by early on. I was, I was, you know, having a petty four, and Brandon sort of sidled up and said, "You're the only person in this cast who can eat all the petty four he wants." <laughs> <laughs> only Brandon could call you fat in such a delicate fashion. I was like, <laughs> "Well done." Uh, oh yeah, you. Definitely could tell the budget by the craft service. Uh, yeah. You get over to that craft <laughs> service table and you start seeing snacks. You're like, whoa, whoa, they got this, they got that. Yeah. Oh, I know. Uh, they got I know. chicken I know. wings. What? Yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly. 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 Or or conversely, it's like, is there mold on this? Yeah, oh, yeah. We're not going to get rid of that until someone eats it. <laughs> Somebody's got to eat that. Somebody got to eat oh, that. that. The celery from get you yesterday? Yeah. yeah. Then we'll get you another donut. But until somebody eats that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, celery. Oh, no. Mr. Billingsley, if I can call you that. Oh, uh, you certainly can. <laughs> one uh, one like question it. I've always had for you as I stared at you on the screen and was like, that is a freaking fun actor. He's really good. Um, the question is whether consciously or subconsciously, were you ever harnessing anybody from your past? at all in the slightest mm. bit with Dr. Phlox or with another character. Sometimes we don't even realize it. We're just kind of like, am I harnessing my old PE coach a little bit? Like sometimes you just kind of sneak into that. Has that ever happened? Uh, no, nope, never has. Not to my knowledge. I mean, you never know, but um, mm. I don't think so. And, and what about the other doctors, uh, Star Trek doctors? Were there, was there any kind of background information that you had to do on that research um, or? No, I mean, I I was not, I'd watched the original series when I was a kid, but I, you know, I was a theater guy, I was traveling a lot, I spent a lot of years on the road, so the next gen, Deep Space with apologies, Voyager years, kind of, you know, zipped right by me. 
I only moved to LA in 1995. I was a stage actor. And so uh, when I got this audition, and then when I got the part, it was like, okay, I don't know who any of these species are. What am I going to do? <laughs> <laughs> I had a pal come over and he gave me like a crash Star Trek course. It's like nice. Romulans. And he showed me select episodes. So I kind of got... So I didn't like have the whole legacy of all the doctors, you know, in my head. So I didn't have any, there was no influencing going on at all. Um, okay. Now I will say. Now what a, about the original series? Any, any kind of, you know, Dr. McCoy, any of the original series? No, cast no, I, it didn't influence. seem to me that my character had anything, you know, there just wasn't any, I would never have thought of Dr. McCoy and, Flocks having mm -hmm. any yeah. particular, you know, yeah. common connection. Out. Well, you mm -hmm. were the first. Bob, Bob Picardo, who uh, who I adore, he's a dear friend of mine, but he sent me because Bob Picardo is always tweaking me. He sent me like, "Dear John, just thought you might be interested in the results of his later latest poll I read, uh, uh, where oh, I was no. voted the most popular doctor, and you were voted the least popular doctor." Love Bob. <laughs> what? <laughs> that was a push poll conducted only within his immediate family so once i okay <laughs> <laughs> and the fact that it was close is scary then <laughs> so i i know whenever i see bob i know let's give a hand for the ninth most popular doctor on star trek <laughs> Since um yeah, <laughs> since leaving <laughs> um Enterprise, how has your relationship with Trek changed since? It, before it's the weirdest thing because it's it's deepened in in ways I would never have imagined. One because I do a lot of charity work, and particularly with the organization I'm involved with now. Um, and the Star Trek fans and the Star Trek community generally, the actors, everybody has been so generous and supportive of my efforts to generate attention and uh, revenue for the Hollywood Food Coalition. So I've gotten more, uh, um, I won't say enmeshed, I've gotten more involved in the Star Trek world than I've ever been. Um, but also, and my wife said this to me when I got this part, she said there are two kinds of people. One kind of person is the person who is always looking for somebody to buy him a beer in a bar. And this is a great gig for you because wherever you go in a bar, you can say, back when I was on Star Trek and somebody. <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I have learned to take advantage of that. Down totally. Here. totally. A rare bar. And then you yeah. squawk. <laughs> yeah. uh, but let's talk a bit more about that you're not just involved and enmeshed in you know the star trek community but you are a trailblazer and a leader among that uh doing things like uh the trek talks recently for the third time as well as running uh being a uh, on the board for the hollywood food coalition if i remember correctly uh you did the united we trek also a uh, pan can can you talk mm. a bit about PanCan mm. and the great work that you and your pals do there? Yeah, uh, PanCan is a pancreatic cancer action network, and it's a wonderful organization that raises awareness um, because so much of, of the fight against pancreatic cancer is rooted in awareness. It's a very fast-moving disease. If you can catch it early and get to the doctor fast, you've got a much higher surviving, uh, rate of survival. So um, this organization has done a marvelous job spreading the word. My mother died of pancreatic cancer uh, at the age of 70 from diagnosis to death, two months. She didn't go to the wow. doctor. She was having stomach issues, back issues. Never entered her mind that it could be pancreatic cancer. By the time she showed up at the doctor, the doctor basically said, nothing I can do. Pancreatic cancer is a killer. Walked away. And she died. So much has changed in large part because of the awareness that this organization brings to the issue. More people understand, particularly if it's in their family, what it is that might be threatening and more doctors understand that there are in fact now options available and treatments available and there's more that can be done. So um, I'm very honored that Kitty Swink, who is herself a pancreatic cancer survivor, asked me to join their team we help raise money throughout the year, but especially around the spring when there is a walk called Purple Stride in 60 plus cities 
all over the country, pancreatic cancer survivors, people who are as lives have been touched by pancreatic cancer, come together and walk again to raise awareness. And like all walks, you know, you raise money, you say, hey, who wants to sponsor me on my walk? And that is our team. And it consists of me and Kitty and Armin, the wonderful Jonathan Frakes, whose brother passed away from pancreatic cancer, and recently Juan Carlos Soto, whose brother, um, Manny Cotto was one of our showrunners. Yeah. Um, so, so that's our team. Mm. We raise money. And uh, if you go to a Pancreatic Cancer Action Network, uh, Pan Can, and look up Purple Stride and look for our team uh, and the name of the team. It's an easy name to remember, and I never can. Team Trek, Trek the team, Team Trexters. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't name it. I, I, all I could say. I, I would have called it John's Big Fat Team, but they, I didn't get a vote. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like that password that pops up that you just can't remember what that password is. I know. Yeah. I know. We'll definitely oh, find but, that. We'll track we'll that find, down yeah. and we I will include it. it in the link below, everybody, so you can click I on that you. and definitely support that. It's very important. Mm -hmm. But you I, were I'm saying infinitely so. more fluid talking about the Hollywood Food Coalition because that has been a, a, a huge big part of my life for the last eight to nine years. So mm -hmm. that's where I can really that's where I can really sing my song. You know, John, um, I really want to commend you, too, because you are one of the people in Star Trek that has dedicated so much of their uh, time and, and, and energy into being charitable and doing things for other people. Uh, and I think that's really uh, remarkable. I know Chase Masterson uh, does a lot of work for people and shows mm -hmm. a level of um, selflessness that's, you know, commendable and I, I also would say that Armin and Kitty that you mentioned that work that they do but um, I think it's very admirable of you to use your celebrity and the platform to raise awareness about these kinds of issues um, you mentioned why you chose pancreatic uh, cancer but just in general I know you for being somebody who's always motivated to be involved not yeah. just like not like just somebody who's like, oh, I'll, I'll sign up or yeah, I'll, I'll put my name, I'll put my name on there. You're actually hands-on involved. I can mm -hmm. see your enthusiasm, um, the energy that you bring when you're at these events. It's like it, it shows that you truly care. Um, and I just want to commend you for bringing that kind of energy, spirit to to the charitable work that you do. Well, as you know, as we were talking about, and here it is: Trek Against Pancreatic Cancer. Yep. There you go. Um, I, uh, it's always been a big part of my life. And I think in large part, to be honest, I was a, I was a stage actor and I lived on under $10,000 a year for almost 15 years of my life. I always checked underneath the sofa cushion before I went out to the bar in hopes that I would find enough money to buy a beer. I always knew who could buy me a sandwich. I was on food stamps. I was on, uh, you know, unemployment was, was a lifeline for me. And I know what it's like to scrape. Um, mm -hmm. And how random it is, how how much fortuity goes into it, how little sometimes control we have over the things that can knock us down and knock us out. So particularly, mm -hmm. even though I've been involved in a variety of different things in, in my life for many years, working with an organization that helped people who had HIV AIDS, because from the theater community, obviously my father's gay, I knew a lot of people who were affected. but some animating impulse for me has always been finding ways to help people who are in need and people who don't who need a leg up um i i i think a social safety net is a, a critical is a measure of a civilized society and we yeah. live in unfortunately right now in a somewhat dark political period when the the not just the necessity but the um the value of a social safety net is questioned. The mm -hmm. idea that a Darwinian world actually asks us not to care about the other guy because somehow we're helping somebody who is not deserving. I find that philosophy to be, you know, is antipathetic to my way of looking at the world. And I think it's antipathetic to the very nature of what Star Trek represents. And what I love about this franchise is that it, it echoes, supports, and is, is a, a huge clarion call to the world that says we only are healthy together. We are only happy together. We can only mm -hmm. accomplish it together. 
it, it is um i'm not a religious person but I, I am a spiritual person and to me star trek has a spiritual message that really resonates for me mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. as i find it does for almost everybody in this franchise which is why I, I find it very easy to actually generate attention and support for the causes I care about because everybody's very, very receptive to helping and, and megaphoning. You know? Absolutely. It's an amazing I community. Agree. It's I amazing. Agree. It is. And, I, and one of the things that interests me personally is that I think there's a line, which I totally understand, particularly for, for young, attractive people who genuinely have to worry about, you know, maybe there's there's a fan who might be. But I love to break down the barrier between fan and actor because I think accessibility and communication, and we're all in this together, is what one makes this franchise unique, and two, it lifts all boats. You know, yeah. it, it, it we started something that I really hope continues uh, called Attractivism Podcast, and it's just about having people on from the Star Trek community, particularly fans who are doing really cool things. It, mm. You know share those stories because so many people do so many lovely things in this world you know it's hard yeah, it's hard to keep it in our heads because the newspaper is fundamentally about shitty thing shitty thing shitty thing right shitty thing, yeah morning, right. Shitty thing. that's what a newspaper does mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. the world is composed of people who do fucking cool things you know um mm -hmm. so a play on activist and track and track uh, for this podcast, this trectivist. Trectivism, yes. Mm -hmm. Trectivism. Hi, baby. Okay. <laughs> so like uh, we just got about a minute left, but everybody at home, there's so much more about the John Billingsley to talk about. All of his charities, all the great work that he does will be in the description box below, including some of the things we discussed, as well as some that we have not yet. But definitely... Go click on those links and start throwing money at stuff because John does good Most work. Kapow! Woo! Woo! Yeah! <laughs> Cue the music. Yeah. <laughs> <Cue it. laughs> uh, all right. Well, uh, everybody, thank you for hanging out with us. John, this has been such a pleasure. We really appreciate mm -hmm. you taking the time. Thank you so much for hanging out. It's been amazing. Lots of laughs. Yeah. Thank you, John. Thanks for having me. Thanks and everybody me. at home, uh, hey, thanks for playing with us. We got way more to talk about, way more stuff on Virtual TrekCon 5. See you soon. Bye.